Our fundamental notion is that we not only have an economic problem, we have an environmental problem. So we always combine the, the justice, the environment, uh, with our analysis of what the answers are. So the fundamental notion is that human beings need to live in consonance with the biosphere. And the biosphere is rooted in place. And our economies need to be rooted in place. So we've, with a huge subsidy from oil, we have been able to divorce our sense of uh, how we can live from the places that we are. But the subsidy from oil is disappearing, and humans are going to need to root their economies much more in place. Not completely in place, but far, far more in place than they are now. And we need economic structures that are human scale. So you need to know much more about we're seeing this movement now, much more about sort of where your food comes from, where your things come from. The, abs the extreme form of absentee ownership that we have in our economy today with the stock market, where people own stocks, they have no idea what stocks they own. This is an extreme form of absentee ownership. And it divorces responsibility for consequences from decision making. And that is a huge, huge error. So as we think about the economic structures that we need, that's where we start. Um, now, the one thing Dave talks about a lot, and we, we talk about it, yes, is, of course, power. And we need to shift the power from Wall Street to Main Street. So that's all part of localizing the economy. Um, the, uh, the money system is, fortunately, I think this movement is helping give attention to the money system. Most people don't think about the money system. They think about corporations. They think about, um, uh, you know, various kinds of, you know, environmental, social injustice issues. But the money system is always treated like a mystery sort of money appears, it disappears, some people have it, some people don't. How, do, how, how does this thing work? So I think one of the big needs is to unpack the money system. And of course, hence the interest in the Federal Reserve, which is a very key instrument in the creation and distribution of money, uh, the banking system, and how do we unpack that and recreate it in a way that works. Now, and I know in this group there's uh, interest in and, and experience uh, in alternative currencies, and that's a uh, very involving and engaging uh, way to get people thinking about money and using money in a different way. Uh, and there's also the need to restructure uh, the actual U.S. dollar system. Um, so, uh, one of the articles in this book is Dave's piece, um, Six Ways to Liberate Main Street from Wall Street. And that's about the money system. So, sort of how could we begin to shift, not begin, but actually shift the power from Wall Street to Main Street. And of course, we just had this wonderful Move Your Money Day and Move Your Money Month, and hopefully it just keeps going on. <laughs> I've been thrilled to see that the credit. Uh, unions announced before Move Your Money Day that they had 650,000 new accounts and 4.5 billion bucks, which of course is chump change for these guys. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, it, it helps small communities. You know, the data on who lends to small businesses is just so striking. The Wall Street does not lend to small businesses. So to the degree that small businesses are the engine of job creation, this is a disaster. So that's why they say credit has dried up. It actually hasn't dried up. Dried up. There actually are uh, banks that lend to, to uh, businesses, but they're the smaller ones. So to begin to feed the energy of the society into, uh, I'll call it just a second, into the structures that actually relate to 
farmers and uh, uh, small business people and uh, people who want to manufacture something and people who want to have a new service and a new uh, uh, nonprofit or whatever uh, is just a, um, uh, a, a fundamental shift that we need to make. Now, I want to make, mention how many of you have been following the move to create state banks? So that's a familiar idea. Uh, we featured a story in this issue on from Stacy Mitchell, who's a fabulous woman from the um, uh, Institute for Local Self-Reliance, on state banks. So many of you may know that North Dakota is the only state that has a state bank. Uh, it was formed, I think it was in 1919. And the reason was exactly the reason we have now. The big banks from out of state, Chicago or New York, were foreclosing on the farms. And the North Dakotans were saying, you know, these banks, they don't understand farming. You know, farming, you have terrible weather, you go down, you have good weather, you go up. You don't foreclose just because you can't buy a firm. So they said, we need our own bank, a bank that will understand us. So they created the State Bank of North Dakota. That's called the Bank of North Dakota. And it's funded with the state's own money. So every state has pension funds, right? They have a float between the time taxes come in and payments go out. In North Dakota, who gets the interest on all that? North Dakota does. So that's one huge advantage of the state bank. So it doesn't go to sucked out to Wall Street and into the global casino. The second thing, and this is really important, is that the bank serves as a partnership structure for community banks. So in North Dakota, there are more community banks per capita than in any other state. And those community banks are lending. And North Dakota has the lowest unemployment. Now, it also has oil, so, you know, your cynics will all say, oh, it's all to do with oil, and it is partly to do with oil. But it also has these structures that are fueling the small business economy, the farmers, uh, the ranchers, so that they can keep going and have kept going through all this uh, turmoil. So, that has fueled a uh, movement to form state banks. And uh, some of you may know the writings of Ellen Brown. Uh, she wrote a book called The Web of Debt, and she's fierce on this state bank thing. Uh, and we publish her articles regularly, and, and other people do too. And um, <coughs> as a result, I believe the last count, there's 14 states that have some level of legislation cooking on the public state bank. I'm from Washington State. That's uh, one place where we have cooked legislation. Oregon is, I think, the farthest along, the most likely to make this push through. Um, and it exists in uh, Michigan and uh, a lot uh, another 12 states, Hawaii. So um, that's one. To answer your question about what are these alternative structures? Well, that's one. Uh, getting the, the whole move your money idea, moving. Uh, uh, our own money to credit unions and community banks so that they then feed the local economy, uh, state banks that can back them up. Now, state banks are going to be tricky and the devil is in the details. So, <laughs> anybody that's involved really has to watch this like a hawk because, you know, these forces of people are going to stick fast things in there. Um, but uh, fundamentally, that structure. There's another idea that uh, comes from William Ryder. Uh, some of you may know him. He wrote Secrets of the Temple. He's probably the biggest expert on our side with the, uh, on the Federal Reserve. And uh, Dave, Dave, we've all learned a ton from William Ryder. And here's an idea that he has that I really like. Our society occasionally needs to expand its money supply. Okay, we have QE2, right? Yeah, we have these quantitative easing. What they do now is the Federal Reserve says we need more money. And they provide that money to the Wall Street banks. 
Well, that's not the only way you could do it. What if instead, and this is Greider's idea, you fed the money into a public bank, not a Wall Street bank, he likes to call it the Federal Reconstruction Recovery Bank. I think that's the name of it, F-R-R-B. Um, so, let's say you need 600 billion new bucks in the system, or at least you think you do. Some people would disagree. <laughs> let's, say, let's say we agree we do. Okay, why not put the 600 billion into the Federal Reconstruction and Recovery Bank, and then it goes to projects like green infrastructure, insulation, bridges, roads, um, uh, solar on everything, whatever. Um, you see, the beauty of this is you're, you're not appropriating tax dollars. Can you imagine 600 billion bucks for this stuff without appropriating tax dollars? I mean, it's just, you know, it's phenomenal. And yet, we're already, it's not like a, a, something we're not doing. They, they did QE2 with 600 billion. So they're doing it, only the banks get the benefit. And that's why they have these billion dollar uh, uh, earnings. And the rest of us can't even imagine earning, uh, earning, uh, receiving, garnering, acting, pulling up the it's just crazy. So there's no reason we have to do it that way. There are other ways to do it. So that's one of Dig's article is six ways to liberate Main Street from Wall Street, and that's one of those six ways. So state bank is another. So we have these alternative structures that are actually not crazy far out radical. They are imaginable. And of course, you know, I'm old enough that when I was a kid. We had rules that a bank could not have branches. Can you imagine? The bank where I lived in Monterey, California could not. It was like the first bank of Monterey County. It, it couldn't have a branch someplace else because it was the, the, the wisdom of the society was that would not be a good idea. You need to root the capital in a certain place. And of course, if you had a mortgage, you had a mortgage with that bank. It didn't get sold off to somebody else. So these structures are within the memory of some people <laughs> on this planet. Uh, and it helps remind us these are not crazy ideas. These were ideas that were in place when our society, when our middle class was much stronger and growing rather than weaker and shrinking. So we transformed all those rules that we kind of had in place. I don't want to paint the 50s as some kind of golden era. We know it was not for many people. But economically, it had some structures in place that were very healthy and were strengthening the economy. And I think, personally, I think allowed for the movements that we saw flower in the late 50s and 60s. The civil rights movement, the women's movement, the environmental movement, all began to uh, ride the, the, the sense of hope and, and uh, uh, confidence that we had at that time.